I see the flying car industry as game changing when it comes to not only future warfare, but future military operations, uh, just as important humanitarian relief operations, hurricane support, all the things that we do defense of the homeland. If you start thinking about these devices as nodes and it fundamentally changes the game. Agility Prime is a program with a vision of world impact. By partnering today with stakeholders across industries and agencies, we can set up the United States for this aerospace phenomenon. Potential outcomes are rewarding and transformative with both military and commercial applications. I want to offer my congratulations to Dr. Roper and his team for achieving this revolutionary rapid contracting and prototyping method to bring industry and DOD together to develop this new exciting technology with both military and civilian applications. This technology will have great benefit to the needs that we have in Alaska and the Arctic where conventional aircraft, vehicles, and vessels oftentimes can't operate. Agility Prime is part of our Defense Department's long history of turning futuristic ideas into reality. I'm proud that the federal government is investing in revolutionary ideas. Agility Prime is leading the way. This launch of Agility Prime is so exciting. This technology has the potential to make vertical flight more affordable and more widely available. And with the encouragement of the U.S. Air Force and the entire federal government, American companies employing American workers can gain a head start and win a fair share of this lucrative market. EV tolls have the same agile, vertical takeoff and landing capability as helicopters, but are quieter and should cost much less to operate because of their electric motors. We are becoming a trusted innovation partner in commercial tech. I could not be prouder of this initiative I could not be prouder of this team. And I am excited to see how quickly we can go to help commercialize this market for our nation so that our warfighters have options they don't have today. And our nation has an economic advantage far into the future. Innovation is a battlefield and Agility Prime is just one way we're gonna win it. Agility Prime seeks to ensure a global advantage in advanced logistics technology. Agility Prime can reduce the risk of adversary commercial dominance, resulting in military disadvantage. As the United States Air Force looks at generating combat power away from runways, those distributed logistics aircraft must be runway independent. This new transformative capability is a promising opportunity to conduct that mission in an affordable and a scalable manner. Today, we gather for Agility Prime to drive transportation innovation, lower barriers to entry, and expand our partnerships. We see a time when automation technologies make the requirements on the pilot much less. And, uh, and we see uh, flying as being accessible to a much wider range of people. It is a, truly a great credit to Agility Prime. They could put on this virtual event with so many hometowns of the United States represented. You know, industrial base is not really about just what a country can make. More than that, it's about the people who dream up what to make. And then of course, those people who make it. Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us again on our weekly edition of Agility Prime Ask Anything. Uh, we're happy to be continuing with our ecosystem tours this week with a, a great group of members from the ecosystem to talk on their relevant technologies to Agility Prime, hopefully build those connections and help us all fly orbs into the future. The Agility Prime team is actually joining me this week from uh, hot and sunny Austin, Texas, where we had a flight demonstration with Lyft Aircraft this week. Um, so check in next week on our webinar for an update from Lyft on their program, their future, and some videos of the demonstration. So then over to our speakers for this week. We have a great lineup coming to you today. We're actually might be stopping a little bit short because one 
person had to uh, an unfortunate conflict, but we'll get started with our, our great first speaker, Porva Bajai, from Innovation Manager from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, speaking on weather observation and avoidance. And we'll move over to Nathan Hansen from the Conductive, Conductive Group in Utah, talk, speaking on electromagnetic shielding. Moving over to Eleanor Mitch, the CEO and founder of 14 BIS Supply Tracking, speaking on digital thread traceability and interoperability in supply chain. Uh, moving over to Amrita Kumar from Aslint Tech, which is fly by fail structural health monitoring. And finally, last but not least, Jeff McKenzer from Target on Arm, speaking on counter SUAS on the move and at range. So we'll get started today with uh, Apoorva Bajai from University of Massachusetts. Apoorva, over to you. Thank you. Hello, folks. Uh, just give me a second here to get started. Uh, so thank you to the Agility Prime team for giving me this opportunity to present our work. Uh, thank you, Sterling, for helping to set up everything. So my uh, talk today is going to be focused on weather observation and avoidance in the new drone economy. Uh, this is work that we've been doing in collaboration with uh, Colorado State University. I'm at the University of Massachusetts. And uh, we partner closely with the North Central Texas Council of Governments. Uh, so a lot of the presentation, a lot of the material presented here is really about work that's happening in the North Central Texas area. So, you know, severe weather obviously has a big impact on the type of uh, vehicles that will inhabit this space. Um, vehicles, especially that are flying in the North Texas area in the future, uh, you know, the type of implications will be on the ride itself uh, with respect to the safety of the cargo on the flights or the passengers themselves and the experience that they have. Um, every time there's a severe weather, it introduces this risk about uh, flying these vehicles, which are not as robust as commercial general aviation airliners. There's an impact of uh, severe weather on the operations themselves when it comes to reliability of the service and efficiency of operations. You know, just as a quick example, uh, you know, are you going to cancel all your operations for the day if it's going to be raining for a part of the day or a location, you know, part of the Metroplex in the Dallas-Fort Worth area? Being able to identify where exactly the rainstorms are and being able to fly around them is an important capability. And then it has this uh, uh, impact just on public safety as well, um, where if you have uh, things like phenomena like hail or tornadoes, you wanna make sure that you're keeping um, all your constituents safe at the water ports. You can take decisions like hangering, which was you know, not traditionally possible with large airliners, but with, with the EV tolls and the orbs, you could actually start taking those decisions about how to keep vehicles safe from strong winds and from hail activity, uh, say on the water ports. So our work at the CASA Engineering Research Center, and CASA is the Center for Collaborative Adaptive Sensing of the Atmosphere, um, has focused on developing these severe weather systems over the last uh, eight years. We've deployed small X-band weather radars in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, and we have brought together partners uh, from other uh, sensing systems. For example, you see a company that's deployed hail sensors in the region uh, that can uh, tell you, you know, what amount of hail, what size hail has fallen across the Metroplex. And we bring together this information from these sensors and model data, uh, storm spotter reports, weather service warnings, and use all of that information um, to decide where the severe weather risks are and then issue um, basically alerts to public safety users like the weather service in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, 
uh, emergency managers, VFW airport, uh, and you know, flood managers over there. And we do this over various platforms, including a mobile app that goes out to about 2,500 users uh, and has issued at this point uh, a couple million alerts related to severe weather since, since 2016. Uh, you know, the next step over here though, severe weather, uh, you know, what type of impact does it have on actual operations when it comes to the different types of uh, vehicles? If you think about just the small UAVs, um, they're being used in the North Texas area for flood rescue efforts and public safety uh, missions. Uh, you see a photograph over here of it supporting a crane collapse in the D Dallas area. But you also have uh, commercial missions taking place right now uh, for things like surveillance of uh, rooftops for moisture damage and bridge inspections. Uh, if, as, as an effort with the North Central Texas Council of Governments, we interviewed a bunch of these operators to understand the types of missions they're doing and how weather impacts their operations. Uh, and the two main concerns that popped up from them were uh, measurements of wind and rain. And you know, with wind, the concern is, can you get enough wind information? Can you resolve the uncertainty in the wind information so that you can decide how you can fly your vehicle and avoid um, you know, running out of battery as you fight the winds? With rain, even small amounts of rain can uh, ruin the photography mission that you're doing or the thermal inspection that you're trying to carry out. Um, traditional severe weather monitoring systems are not monitoring for small amounts of rain, and they're basically incapable of measuring um, you know, widespread wind damage, uh, wind assessments at the low heights where these drones are flying. Uh, there is a bunch of wind data available in the North Texas area, and this is true probably in most parts of the country. You can get wind information at the surface from the local ASOS stations at the airports, uh, available through META reports. But these are, you know, few and far. Uh, they are away from the locations where operations are actually taking place, and they still represent just what's going on at the ground and they're not available as frequently as, as uh, operators would need them. Uh, there are other commercial weather stations in the region as well, and this is true in other parts of the country as well, but again, this is mostly all surface winds, and uh, people are essentially flying blind because they're relying on wind forecasts and not on real observations and forecasts uh, it is hard to get a high resolution uh, wind forecast available for operators and uh, make it commercially available. So in our work, we are pulling together all of these different types of uh, aviation weather sources uh, through our City One alerting platform. And this is something we think is a way in which uh, you know, this industry will proceed in terms of weather observations. It's taking advantage of government data sources uh, like the radars that are out there and you know, additional wind sensors and models and bringing them all together in a common system, identifying where the hazards are and then issuing location specific alerts, maybe alerts you know, specific to the drone route or the uh, orb route that's planned. And we've demonstrated such a system in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We have some ongoing projects right now. We're supporting Bell in a demonstration of their APT vehicle. Uh, this is a vehicle that's designed for medical, uh, that will support medical missions. And there's a demonstration of this capability of you know, taking all of these weather observations and making it available to that platform later this fall. Uh, another part of this effort is to now also standardize uh, what's being done. So we're participating in the NASA Advanced Air Mobility National Campaign with a bunch of other partners. And this will allow us to make uh, weather information available um, through these different uh, companies that will be the USSs, you know, the service suppliers and the PSUs uh, of the future that will support these ORB missions. 
Uh, finally, our last piece of research is focused on optimizing the routing of drones and orbs uh, through severe weather. So as you see some screenshots of the preliminary work we're doing. Since we know where the weather hazards are and we can discretize that and uh, you know, create polygons of risk, we can now start uh, creating alternate routes uh, for getting you from point A to point B. Uh, this is my last slide over here, um, and then we can open this up for questions if we have the time. We are looking to grow this ecosystem in the North Texas area along with the North Central Texas Council of Governments. Uh, one of the ideas is to bring additional uh, sensors into the region. Uh, here are some ideas for you know, uh, products that are available in the industry. Um, the two on the left are uh, LIDARs. Um, these are traditionally reused in the renewable energy space, but if these types of LIDARs can be deployed in the urban environment, they can generate uh, great profiles of the uh, wind in the lowest parts of the atmosphere. Um, so we would be very interested in installing these in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. There's also a future opportunity with uh, you know, the drones and the orbs themselves uh, collecting weather information and sending it back to a central location, very similar to uh, the way pirates are handled. Uh, right now, or the TAMDAR system works, where basically the vehicle collects information either through a sensor or through its dynamics and makes it available uh, for use by everyone in the ecosystem. So um, I, I just wanted to end with saying, you know, we're doing a lot of interesting work in North Central Texas, uh, setting up this urban aviation weather test bed to demonstrate how weather observation and avoidance can work. And I, Look forward to uh, folks contacting me. You can see my email and my LinkedIn information below. Um, and join us uh, in our work in North Texas. Thank you. Thank you, Paro. That was a great. Uh, I have a few questions for you a little bit. Um, have you guys begun work with any UTM software companies where they can pull data from your weather system into their software? Or can you speak a little bit on that on integration with service providers in the UTM space? Yes, so in the National uh, Advanced Air Mobility Campaign uh, with NASA, that's exactly the work that we're doing, is uh, taking the information that's coming from all of these different weather systems and making it available to these uh, uh, USS type suppliers uh, that we're working with. And uh, you saw the names of a few companies there, uh, OneSky and uh, uh, I think well, Frequentis, these are two companies that are doing uh, work and they participate you know, either as the USSs themselves or as supplemental data service providers uh, within that whole uh, UTM architecture. Sure, sounds good. And then can you just speak a little bit on the technological barriers to increasing accuracy of weather tracking on a micro scale? I mean, I know the, the real drive here is to get to micro weather tracking. Can you just speak a little yeah. bit on the technological barriers or near-term pursuits that you're working on? Right, so the biggest challenge is just uh, that we don't, our infrastructure doesn't support uh, adequate observations. So a lot of the instruments that I demonstrated over here have the capability uh, to measure uh, wind, for example, the way uh, we need it measured, but they just aren't deployed in the numbers uh, that are needed you know, the questions remain about, you know, who is going to deploy this type of architecture. Uh, the other, you know, challenges are uh, just having the compute and bandwidth infrastructure and the, you know, cloud computing, edge computing facilities that you need in order to gather all of that weather information quickly, process it, generate those, that risk information and share it and then generate those alternate routes. So all of that requires a very robust uh, infrastructure for moving data around. And that again remains a technological barrier because even though there are a lot of ideas about how to implement those uh, with you know, 5G coming on board, uh, you don't see a lot of those implementations in these areas. And we're hoping that we can do some of that work in North Texas. 
But yeah, thank you. And then we have a question from the audience here. Mr. Bill Kleinbacker is asking, what is the smart city value with having weathered data, particularly from LIDAR observation? So I guess just a little bit on smart city integration of your platform. Sure. Um, so the idea is that, you know, in cities like Dallas and Fort Worth, you know that there's going to be a lot of uh, vertiports ports and a lot of operations that are targeted for these uh, cities where aircraft and drones will be taking off from skyscrapers and parking garages right within the city. Uh, right now, if you're going to proceed with setting up this uh, infrastructure, you know, independent of additional weather infrastructure, you're additionally, you're basically introducing a lot of risk in your operations so that, uh, you know, vehicles uh, can be, you have a wind gust above a parking garage that you didn't anticipate. And during that critical, uh, you know, takeoff or landing phase, you're going to crash into nearby buildings or, you know, just endanger the lives of passengers. Um, so to the extent that you can architect uh, a system that equips your smart city, you know, your city with these different IoT sensors uh, like the LIDARs um, that can give you additional information, um, you know, you're empowering all of these operations. The, the great thing about weather infrastructure is that it has implications all across, uh, you know, smart city initiatives. So, you know, better weather information is going to help you to decide, um, you know, in public safety, which roads to close uh, due to flooding, how to reroute traffic based on uh, wind damage or flood damage. Um, and then, you know, just planning transportation in general um, with more accurate weather information, you can influence that all across the board, not just with urban, uh, you know, air, uh, not just with aerial emissions. I'm sure, well, thank you, Apoorva. That was a great talk. Uh, lovely work you're doing and definitely keep it up. So thank you for coming on. We definitely appreciate it. Thank and you. I much. think actually Bill might be asking you a few more questions in chat if you want to talk over the tech with him, but we're going to go ahead and switch over to uh, Nate Hansen from the Conductive Group out of Utah to speak on electromagnetic shielding. Nate, over to you. Okay, great. Uh, thanks very much, Sterling. Uh, sound coming through okay? Yeah, we got you loud and clear, sir. Thank you. Okay, cool. And we got video too? Yes, sir. All right. Fantastic. Very good. So uh, to explain a little bit about what we're doing at the Conductive Group is we're thinking a lot about material properties and about uh, you know, where things go. And, you know, we, we, we refer to this as ages socially. We talk about the Stone Age and the Bronze Age and the Iron Age and all these other things. And we like to think that we're entering what we'd call a, a plastics age and a composites age. And they're great because they're lightweight and they're cost effective. And everybody knows all the reasons why we want to build things out of carbon fiber or whatever type of fiber or whatever type of thermoplastic. Uh, what we're seeing is that, and I think everybody sees this, is that there's also a change in the environments that we're required to operate inside of. So our concerns about uh, electromagnetic shielding and electromagnetic signals, not only between systems, but required to operate within systems are also moving along. So there's really these two big forces that are moving together here. One is, is that we're wanting to build everything out of plastic and out of composite and for a lot of great reasons. The other is, is that wireless environments and electromagnetics and digital information are increasingly important. They're really important. And so where these two come together is the area where we work because composites and plastics generally don't do a great job uh, moving electrons around or blocking radio waves. And so we work in this sweet spot in the middle where we try and find multifunctional solutions to conductivity and shielding in composite systems. So just a little bit about, of a snapshot about who we are as an organization. Uh, we're a small business located in Utah. We've been doing what we do for a few decades. We have a couple of facilities and sites that we operate in. We do our business under three main brands and those are listed right here on the chart. And we'll talk a little bit about what those products are really quick as well too. Um, we've received some nice recognition as we've grown and scaled our business. The point we're at right now is investing heavily in scale up and in making our products available. But along with that, 
We have uh, sales into commercial markets already. We have strong federal contracting history with multiple contract vehicles that are even open right now. We've developed a portfolio of intellectual property, and it's a mix of formal and informal. Uh, and we use that with our partners and with companies that we develop platforms for. And uh, like I mentioned just a second ago, investing very heavily in manufacturing capabilities and expansion right now. And we're including some manufacturing certifications on that. So, you know, kind of that whole concept about you start with an idea in a lab, and then it eventually has to scale up and mature and go out to the world. That's really the point that we're taking things to right now. So let's take a look at some of these um, questions and concerns that we're thinking about, right? If we're thinking about shielding and electromagnetics, one question is, where does the problem come from? So that's like that, that cloud right there, right? It could be man-made things like electromagnetic interference or, or perhaps an electromagnetic pulse, or it could be natural things such as a solar event or such as lightning. And there's, there's all these things that have to live and operate in the wild. And specifically for this context that we're discussing today, they need to fly through the air and stay in the air. So what can we do to keep them there? How do we make these lightweight composite systems that have a great amount of resilience? And so we've thought about a lot of these areas right here about how do we engineer them so that they can be protected against lightning damage? How do we engineer them to be protected against operating through those harsh environments? How do we lighten them? And then also, how do we support some of those ground-based components, you know, that actually hold everything together? So, uh, and, and just quick note too, you know, these are all just kind of concepts we're presenting right here. And all these platform images are illustrative. Uh, a few of the pictures on these charts are products we make and the rest are, you know, kind of cartoons. But we wanted to pull out a specific example of that right here, right? So how could this apply to things that need to fly? Now, uh, now, I know this isn't the right picture for this crowd either as well, too. You know, this really ought to be, uh, you know, more of an orb picture, but all of the functions are the exact same, where we want to consider what type of shielding is needed at the aeroshell component of that orb, or what type of shielding is needed for the internal components within that. We're likewise considering, how about lightning strike damage and lightning protection? How about resistive de-icing? There are solutions in industry today that are used for that. Uh, they typically rely on metal meshes, which can be prone to corrosion. Uh, they're, they're fairly heavy. They generally don't provide a lot of shielding protection. Uh, we have some materials that are lighter weight, do provide more shielding, and are a lot better in corrosion. So there's some good solutions that can be plugged in right there. And then we started looking at how everything is connected. So all of those systems inside need to be connected by cabling and through conduits. So how do we make those lightweight? and also highly protective. And uh, we've also done work thinking about the antennas. How are those antenna systems either made conformal or lightweight or both? And then how is what that is carrying around shielded, right? So, so perhaps you have you know, a, a mothership, so to speak, that has all sorts of subsystems or subships that need to go out from it. Um, how do you protect those and give those the same type of benefit um, that is on you know, the master craft, so to speak? And our thinking here is that whatever we do needs to be multifunctional. Um, it has to provide uh, you know, structure and conductivity in most cases. And we've also worked to make sure that what we're doing from a fundamental materials perspective is you know, platform agnostic, vendor agnostic. These are things that can be integrated in a number of manufacturing processes. So whether, you know, whether an orb aeroshell is being made by an infusion process or a wet layup process, or a pre-preg process or a match tooling compression process, whatever that might be, you know, uh, we have a way to that. And then that, that box at the lower gray right there as well too, thinks about how about all the supporting ecosystem on that? So, you know, what's going on inside the, uh, you know, the operation center, so to speak, or the traffic control center, wherever that might be located and what type of shielding might be needed in those facilities to make sure that there's good uh, you know, functional resilience against whatever's going on externally. And then how about the componentry, you know, as things ship around uh, or as they operate, be it either in computer rack mount cases or storage cases or even mobile command centers, uh, you know, like expandable, um, you know, ISO containers that are meant for field operations and relocatability. How do we incorporate shielding into those lightweight systems? So I think everybody's probably catching the theme uh, of what we're saying here. And it's, you know, how are we considering including shielding 
and protection in all these lightweight systems as the environment evolves and as it, you know, as we think will continue to evolve as it goes forward. So that, that's pretty much my story, actually. It's a, it's a fairly short story for today's purposes. Uh, my contact information is right here. Uh, my vice president for business development is also on this call as well, too, listening in. His contact information is there as well, too. And we're happy to work with uh, everybody inside this system to try and push this technology forward. And I think that gives me a few minutes for questions. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Nate. I appreciate it. Uh, if anyone from the audience has any questions, I'll, I'll ask a few now. I know a lot of our performers speak about basically flying around in a cloud of electromagnetic interference due to the propulsion system. Can you speak a little bit on how you might be able to isolate the certain propulsion systems and shield them separately than the actual comms arrays so that they do have a, so, so like a tunnel out to communicate? Right, so if I heard your question right, it's how do I, how do I take two components on one aircraft and make sure they've got discreting in each level and still communicate between? Well, that as well as also communication out. I mean, the electronic propulsion systems, high power motors, high power cabling seems to create almost a cloud of interference that these planes will be flying around in. You know, that is a, a lot of times interfering with their comms out to other aircraft or even ground stations, which could be a problem oh. going into the future. Okay, so so maybe maybe two cam two comments on that then. So one comment is is that uh, you know shielding the propulsion systems and the discrete components is going to start to cut down and eliminate how much of that is even escaping in the first place. Uh, it's gonna cut down how much of that cloud is being <clears throat> created, so to speak. Um, maybe it'll even eliminate some of it, depending on what type of measures are taken. And then a second comment is for you know, communicating between things, uh, that can be done with a couple of different methods. Like it's possible to make shielded things that still have plenty of communication that goes in and out of them, it just depends on how that communication goes in and out. So you either filter it and send it through the typical, you know, copper-based wiring, or you use fiber optic systems. Because fiber, that's one of the great things about fiber optic is it doesn't carry spurious radio waves with it as it moves along. Yeah, that's a great insight. Um, I definitely appreciate that. Um, just for the folks on here, do you guys work as a consultant business? Do you sell product line? How does how does your company work in, in that respect? Yeah, no, that, uh, that's a great question. Uh, we do sell product. Um, we do also make product. We, we work on that whole spectrum. So there's, there's some markets where our best role is uh, working with other companies to help them understand and insert multifunctional composite materials that, you know, we'll sell that by the pound, by the foot, whatever product it is. And then there's other markets where we work with those companies to develop a product and we bring a bit more expertise to the table. Then there's been one or two where we just go ahead and make the actual finished product. Uh, our Faraday Cases company is an example of that. Yeah, for sure. And I guess just, I know this is a difficult question to answer as it's probably quite varied on a case by case basis, but what kind of weight increase do you see? And maybe just some common example to give us an idea of what it, what it costs in terms of weight to shield the structure. Oh, no, that's actually a really great question. Uh, and it is also a complicated question. Um, I'll give you a couple of benchmarks on weight to start with. The typical weight savings that we see that somebody realizes by going to composite instead of metal is usually in the 25 to 80% range. So 80% is on the extreme end, and those are people that have been using really heavy, dense stuff. The 25% is usually more on the side of people who have been using aluminum uh, or, or lighter weight, better engineered structures. So either way you go, there's a, there's a pretty big weight uh, advantage that can be gained right there. And that weight advantage I'm referring to also considers uh, the shielding materials. That's with the shielding materials inside the composite. So, I mean, they, they obviously weigh something. So without that, the increase is even better than that. So generally, that's what, that's what somebody is expecting is, you know, a, a pretty decent chunk yardage on the weight increase. Now, in terms of what they pay for it, uh, it might not be very much. Uh, in some cases, it's even cost savings relative to the ways that they were doing things before. And in some cases, there is a pretty good premium to it. Usually that's tied with performance, where really high performance is needed. It's kind of tough to get away from that cost vector. And in other areas where it's not as stringent, there's a lot of leeway in how those costs roll forward. So I don't know if I can give you an exact number on the costing, but I will tell you that it's generally not, uh, it's, it, if, if people think it's expensive, by the time you look at the whole value proposition of how it incorporates into the landed cost, it's not. Yeah, no, for sure. So I guess in your case, you're kind of speaking about 
products who already have other shielding and then they're switching to your product. I Very interesting, of course. I would also be interested in those cases where a product would not be shielded at all and then what the, the weight penalty would be to add shielding. So right, that might sure. might not have been engineering with that in mind in the first place and now maybe running into a problem. Yeah, yeah. If, it, if it's been engineered in composite and then it's all of a sudden, oh my goodness, we need shielding, it's usually a couple of percent to add it in. Okay, very, very good to hear. So incorporated pretty easily. All right, we have a question from the panelists here. Oh, never mind. It's a comment. Okay. Well, thank you, Nate. I appreciate it. That was very informative for me, especially, and I hope the, the folks on the line enjoyed it as well. Thank you for joining us. Nice. So, great. Thank you. Now we're going to be switching over to Ms. Eleanor Mitch, the CEO and co-founder of 14PIS Supply Tracking, to speak on digital thread and traceability. Eleanor, over to you. Hi. Um, I hope you all can hear me. Yeah, Let we me got you. Screen share. Already. Bear with me for a sec. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eleanor Mitch, and I'm CEO and co-founder of 14Bit Supply Tracking. We work in asset tracking, digital, physical, and hybrid assets. Um, and uh, we got our name, for those of you who are curious, from the plane that flew the first self-sustained, self-powered flight in Europe in 1906. Uh, called the 14 bis and it was uh, by aviator and inventor Alberto Santos Dumont uh, in Paris. So as I said, we track digital, physical, and hybrid assets. Um, and I'm going to kind of go through why we started the company. We were looking initially at aviation supply chains and uh, with supply chain logistics and what the problems people are encountering. And we were very interested to learn how um, aviation parts were being tracked. And I'll give you a hint, it's very sophisticated technology. A lot of the times it's spreadsheets, uh, your run-of-the-mill Excel or pieces of paper on a clipboard or software systems that don't talk to one another, which inevitably can lead to uh, delayed important missions or for commercial, the problem of aircraft on ground. Um, and here we see the famous yellow tags uh, that are the tags that identify certain parts of an engine. Um, so we kind of drilled down and saw two key factors that contribute to these complexities, one of which was uh, the database incompatibility, not knowing which is the most accurate, and also the fact that a lot of the supply chain, um, even in a manufacturing site, is oftentimes done with paper-based documentation, not to mention the documentation that the FAA requires for um, airworthiness, for example. So this has uh, kind of problems for Jim, your inventory manager, who doesn't know what is where and when it's going to get there. Um, or Maria, the IT manager, who's working among different systems that don't talk to one another and has to reconcile data and make sure that things are updated properly. Or, um, and here's one case that uh, happens very often, is the technical order, the new technical order, is not updated on the bill of materials. So that sometimes that information can take months on end to be updated to the bill of materials. So you have, you know, the engineers that are struggling um, with that situation. So we uh, created, uh, we are a software company providing products that focus on systems interoperability. We do incorporate blockchain technology, and this is how uh, the technology works. We, I'm going to draw your attention to the eight o'clock where it says tag agnostic. So we work um, with any sort of tag, be it a QR code, barcode, nanoparticles, invisible inks, or other stealth technologies that can be applied to a part. Um, we can bring it up into a cloud or work on premises or with edge technologies and then automatically update whatever software system and a company or an organization might work with. And that includes legacy systems, so that there's uh, flows of data among these systems and then you have the secure record um, to which it can point. So there's automatic updates. If you look at 10 o'clock, it shows IoT devices, and that's sort of to symbolize uh, digital asset tracking and hybrid asset tracking because for digital asset tracking can be different types of files. So a CAD drawing from an engineer to a PDF to a video file or from IOT devices, 
uh, or 3D printing, it can be from the digital file all the way through to the actual production and delivery of the 3D printed part that could have a tag applied on top or embedded in it, and then we can track the full life cycle. Um, in addition, we provide data analytics. So how is this related to eVTOL? And I'm gonna show you a little video. Hopefully you can see it. There's no sound, so don't worry. Um, so basically a lot of these problems were still were, so we have um, aviation, traditional aviation, but a lot of the, how are the software systems and the data systems going to be updated um, are gonna still persist um, as we move into eVTOL. Um, so here's the software systems that don't talk to one another. And here's the, those bill of materials and technical orders that, you know, the FAA is trying to validate or in a military situation, the engineers are trying to update. And here are the different file types. You can see the 3D printed file types and CAD drawings. Um, we basically are able to secure the data and provide um, a pointer to it on the blockchain and track it. So here is an example that was just an example of a Boeing eVTOL. Here's that was another one. Um, some of them will have maybe only a hundred uh, parts versus um, others that will have only less than 10 uh, unique parts. Here's uh, some of the milestones that we've um, received and back to the other presentation. So this is what I was mentioning. So here we have a Boeing uh, rotor hub that has less than 10 unique parts versus your Robinson R44, which will have a hundred uh, different parts that will compose that rotor hub. So inevitably with these, um, EV tolls or flying orbs, you're going to have to, or one should be able to track and ensure the supply chain that creates these um, objects that are going to be flying above. We're currently working with the U.S. Air Force um, and are working specifically right now on maintenance and reliability uh, of the of common support equipment, and uh, we've been working with BAE systems. Um, here is our team. Um, that you can see, uh, so we, our chief scientist is Thomas Harjono, who was the chair of the Congressional Caucus on Blockchain and Supply Chain, and is a P2P networking cryptography expert. Uh, we also have um, engineers with a lot of background in building and scaling uh, software. Uh, so that here's kind of reiteration. We're actually very proud because we just be, were invited to be members of the Space Information Sharing and Access Center. So we're a member of the Space ISAC. And so uh, what would it mean to you if you had better insight and control and you could make sure you had the right part in the right place at the right time? Um, that is the goal of our company and I'm happy to answer any questions you all might have. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Eleanor, I appreciate it. So. For our companies in particular, a lot of them are on the smaller startup scale and they're hearing a lot about digital threat and they're hearing a lot of these this buzzword, this, what can it really mean to us? And can you just speak a little bit on the value proposition of integrating it early in their supply chain, early in their design thinking versus trying to integrate it later? And really, how do they do that cost benefit analysis of incorporating it sooner? Okay, so the first part is how, what's the benefit of integrating early the digital thread? Um, so for that, um, so for example, a lot of companies are looking into 3D printing and also starting to manufacture these parts. I actually had, uh, I don't know if you noticed in the little video, um, an image of an Ember Air X eVTOL that they are working on. Um, and one of the benefits of getting that addressed early on is that you actually have um, the whole traceability, or I like to say chain of custody, of an asset from the actual engineer's drawing through out if you get started now versus having to backtrack. Um, a lot of the times uh, people say, well, you know, here we have these old, for, for existing aviation. They'll say, well, we have um, in commercial aviation, we have a lot of these parts. We don't, we have some of the documentation, but not all. Sure, it's good to have it, but it's always better if you can start from the beginning and the part actually being fabricated. So it's a real golden opportunity. Um, plus, once you have the basis, it's actually 
a lot easier for it to scale and provide access um, to certain data fields that you'd like to share with partners. So for example, the FAA might want to know. Um, so one of the products that we have actually auto helps auto populate a lot of the compliance documentation like the 8130-3 for um, the airworthiness form for the FAA. So that kind of will help um, speed up some processes. And your second question was about how you can um, identify the cost of the ROI on the investment. Is that correct? Yeah, for sure. I just know that a lot of companies, when they're in their small lead startup stage, they're really thinking very lean and how to, is this worth it now? Do I wait until I'm ready to start manufacturing? At what stage do I start thinking about these things? So for a startup, um, I think I would at least start thinking about it. Um, if you're still in a doing feasibility studies, uh, if you're uh, really starting um, to look at producing and working on actually getting things up and flying, I think it's always a benefit um, just in terms of audit for audit purposes to have that data and, and you've already done the groundwork. Um, but then again, I'm kind of a manic organizer. So maybe that's, that's me. In terms of ROI for um, a larger company that would be uh, investigating this, um, we've worked with a uh, transportation specialist, uh, Oliver Wyman, and which is a consultancy, and the savings that we provide are uh, just on kind of inventory uh, carrying. So the cost of carrying inventory is about 30%, which has a 50% impact on bottom line. And then in parallel, by digitizing a lot of the processes, um, it's a 75% savings on, you know, the... John walking with his clipboard over to another building and getting Fred to realize this. Plus, you have the added um, safety of not having people falsify documents. Um, as late as uh, February 2019, I don't know if you all remember, but in Florida, there was a FAA agent who was um, signing off on 8130-3s at $75 a pop. Luckily, he was caught, but, um, you know, there is that risk. Yeah, for sure. And then just a little bit for, for those on the phone who might be less familiar with what you do, can you speak a little bit how it is not just digital record keeping, it, it's pattern recognition and the power that that gives you as you optimize things down the line? Correct. So, for example, with the Air Force, um, as I mentioned, uh, we're working um, not only with uh, keeping records, but also providing data analytics, uh, which helps for procurement and um, doing preventive maintenance and identifying uh, for example, if uh, one certain location in the world has uh, greater problems with X sort of um, material than, you know, Y location, for example. So a lot of data analytics that can be um, very useful to have a global picture of enterprise. Yeah, for sure. And then just one last question. I know mm -hmm. in, in our talks internally, we talked about digital twin a lot, whether this is the reality a possibility soon or, or long term. Just, I would love to hear your take on how close we are to a full digital twin of an airplane, what that looks like maybe. And just okay, a little so bit when, someone who might be talking about that space more than us. Right, when you say full digital twin of, air, of an airplane, um, do you mean shared among all parties that have um, a vested interest in said airplane or only among the uh, manufacturer of the airplane? I guess I don't know. I would love to hear the difference. Okay. So on the, um, if it was the full digital twin of the airplane, yes, it's doable. Uh, I, if to the scale of having all vested, all parties, which might have an interest in said airplane, meaning all throughout the supply chain. So if you take Acme Corps who fabricates an airplane and all the little individual suppliers, the trickle down, that's uh, that's the thing that is going to take a little while. I mean, it's not overnight, but at least within an organization, once an organization starts and it has the uh, nudging effect of getting others uh, perhaps to uh, get on board. And that's one way, um, just from our perspective, it's been very interesting to see the Air Force have been so open um, about looking at uh, the technology because that 
has a fold over to private industry, which has been a lot more hesitant. Um, kind of everybody's kind of waiting for someone to dip their toe in the pool. So um, the Air Force seems to be the first one. There's people who are doing a lot of POCs, but um, kind of full up uh, wide scale. It, it, it will take a while, but it's something that inevitably needs to be done. Perfect. No, I appreciate that perspective. And uh, thanks again for coming on. Let me check if we have any questions from the audience real quick. Oh yeah, here's one from Mr. Mr. Glenn. Ms. Mitch, so if we as an OEM want to start out with an inventory system, do you have a starter kit? Does it easily work or is it interoperable with ERP systems? Uh, so this is Mr. Newton, right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so yes, uh, oops, sorry, I have to change my Google password. Um, yes, uh, we do have a quote unquote starter kit. Oops, it, it disappeared. Um, sorry, I lost it. I was looking and then I lost it. Oh, okay. Uh, we do have a starter kit. It, um, we've built it so that there's not Basically, we can do it two ways. Either we provide the UI or we integrate it with existing UIs or user interfaces that a company has. Some companies do not want us to interrupt their processes and they, they've trained their employees. So we work with the existing system and provide a quote unquote invisible backend. Um, others like the Air Force have wanted um, the UI. So we've created that as well. So it's um, either way, uh, our big goal is to make it so that um, user friendly people like to use it. One of the things we found when working uh, with the different uh, private companies and the Air Force was these ERP systems were so complex that people were just pulling their hair out having to read PDFs and figure out what button to push to get something. And so inevitably, a lot of times they weren't even accessing the data that might have been available. So one of the goals we do have is to make uh, make it easy to access, find, and make a look at the data to make decisions. So I hope I answered that question. I'm happy to um, give a private demo of it um, to whomever is interested. No, for sure. Thank you, Eleanor. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Great info. And then uh, now we're going to switch over to Ms. Amrita Kumar from Excellent Technologies, who's going to speak on a fly by fill and structural health monitoring. So Amrita, over to you. Yes. Uh, hi. Hello, everybody. So uh, my name is Amrita Kumar, and I actually recorded uh, my video already. So I'm going to share that here with you. One minute. If you give me a minute here. So Rita, I'm not hearing the sound come through. Oh, you're not, you're not, okay. Okay, uh, hold on for a minute. Let's try this again. Yeah, for sure, no problem. Yeah to safely oh, develop. Yeah, we, we can hear it now if you just start over. Okay. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Amrita Kumar, and I'm the now, executive president for okay. Aislinn Technologies. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about structural health monitoring systems. As you know, the urban air mobility markets are looking to safely develop an air transportation system that moves people and cargo between places. The key word here is safely. Safety and operational efficiency requires that these urban air mobility platforms have the ability for autonomous structural inspection, uh, structural health management tr uh, tracking of the entire fleet, and operational efficiency and agility is to provide these capabilities and to build self-diagnostic intelligence into autonomous transportation vehicles to enhance their operational safety. This is to use what is, what is called structural health monitoring. Typically, when you need to inspect 
a structure for damage. Um, it, you use what is called non-destructive inspection techniques, which involve a lot of human interaction and require access to the structural area of interest. With structural health monitoring, we incorporate a network of sensors with the structure and use this kind of non-destructive inspection techniques to determine whether or not there is any kind of damage in the structure, its location and size. Because the sensors are integrated directly with the structures, once the sensors are integrated, you don't need to disassemble the structures anymore to get access to that kind of information. The, the system can be made completely autom auto uh, autonomous and can provide um, information on demand on whether or not the, the structural integrity of that platform has been compromised. A structural health monitoring system typically consists of three components. A flexible smart layer sensor network, uh, and this is a very, very thin uh, flexible film that can be integrated with any kind of new or existing structures. And the, the, da the data from the sensors is collected using a lightweight data acquisition hardware. And we provide the intelligent data analysis software that can interpret this data to, to, to let you know whether or not, first of all, there is any damage on the structure, the location of that damage, and the size of that damage, and how this damage information correlates to the life cycle of that particular structure. Structural health monitoring systems have a lot of advantages. Because the sensors are integrated with the structure, as I had mentioned, you don't need any structural disassembly. Inspection can be performed in minutes, and you don't need to wait for a particular schedule to perform the inspection. You can do inspection based on the actual condition of the structure. You can monitor any size of structure, whether it's small or large, from a fitting to an entire fuselage of an aircraft. The sensors are very thin and conformable to any shape and size, and can be integrated with any kind of metal or composite structure and the information provided by the SHM system can uh, enable decisions on whether to repair or replace the component. Does the SHM system work? So we typically use piezoelectric transducers and we use them in two operational modes. The first mode is called the active ultrasonic tech sensing. Uh, so we integrate the sensors with the structure and use the piezoelectric transducers as actuators and sensors. So we actuate one and receive from the neighboring sensors. Then we, we actuate the other one and receive from the neighboring sensors. So essentially we perform a scan of this entire area. When, when we need to check for damage on the structure, we perform this operation once more and our software uses the uh, information provided by these piezoelectric transducers to determine the location of the damage and its size. And that can enable the user to determine what to do with that structure to repair or replace. That we provide in using this exactly the same piezoelectric transducers is to use it for acoustic uh, impact detection. In this case, the sensors are, are actively listening for any kind of impact that can occur on the structure. And if that impact exceeds a certain threshold, then it will, it will activate the software to let you know where that impact occurred, the location of that impact, and whether or not that force of impact actually caused any kind of damage. Acelent Technologies is a global leader in structural health monitoring, providing end-to-end -end solutions that ensure the integrity and safety of structures. Situated at the core of the industrial Internet of Things, Acelent offers a platform based around big data and AI that provides real-time updates on the health and condition of structures. By shifting maintenance from schedule-based to condition-based, we lower costs, reduce downtime, and improve safety. Our system pairs a flexible layer of piezoelectric sensors, called the smart layer, with data acquisition hardware and software 
to perform continuous, non-destructive evaluation. Our smart layers are durable, can be surface mounted or embedded, and are customizable to any shape or size. The distributed network of sensors allows large areas to be monitored, not just discrete points. Composites are becoming increasingly popular in a wide range of industries. Although strong and lightweight, composites are susceptible to impact damage. By reporting the location and force of impacts, our system keeps your maintenance crews one step ahead. Another application of our system is quantifying delamination and debonding in composites, even when invisible to the naked eye. Our compensation algorithms guarantee accuracy regardless of environmental conditions. When paired with our advanced prognostic software, we can also predict the remaining usable life of structures. For more than two decades, Aceland has supplied SHM systems to multiple industries across the globe, ranging from transportation to energy. Welcome to the age of smart structures. Thank you, Amrita. Is that the end of the, your uh, No, I was to continue. Uh, hold on for a minute. I might have, I don't know what happened here. Give me one minute. I had supposed to continue here again. Uh, so sorry about this. Okay. Are, so, you, are you able to see this? The structural health. No, I think you just have to share your screen once again, Amrita. Okay, hold on. Go back to this and share this. Sorry about this, but I had prepared it as a... Okay. Can you so see it now? To yeah, summarize, okay, the SHM system can provide multiple capabilities. In terms of damage detection, we can monitor damage in any kind of metal or composite structure like fatigue cracks, uh, impact related damage, uh, composite response of delamination, corrosion. Uh, we can also monitor usage of these structures, um, uh, usage related damage such as bolt loosening, uh, damage due to loading conditions, and also provide information for flight envelope um, that can exceed uh, the event recording. Um, we can also provide information on other states uh, of the structure like temperature, acceleration, and vibration. The structural health monitoring systems have been tested and validated on several defense and commercial uh, aircraft platforms. And we have actually worked with several OEMs um, to both incorporate our sensors and systems into their platforms and conduct flight testing. would like to use our experience on providing these SHM systems to all these aircraft uh, platforms and translate that to the air mobility platforms and to enable autonomous inspection, fleet health management, and operational agility for all air mobility platforms. Thank you very much for your time. And if you have any further questions, uh, you can contact me directly and I will be happy to answer them. Thank you. Okay. Thank okay, you. Very Maria, that much. was great. Uh, so yeah, let me just pull up my uh, slide here so that you can see uh, the last slide. Um, but yeah, if uh, I mean, if you have further questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah, for sure. So I definitely have a few just for my end. Sure. Um, first, starting out with as a design engineer, how does this change the design process when you begin your your aircraft design from a design going forward? And just a little bit, what is the cost impact over the manufacturing life of designing an aircraft with your system embedded? So um, it's actually good if you can actually design the aircraft with the uh, system embedded in there. Um, the reason being that, you know, typically like we, uh, and if you take the case of composite structures, you tend to over design the structures, you know, typically the composite structures are made a little bit more heavier uh, than they really need to. So with the structural health monitoring system incorporated in there, you know when you can actually see the damage and that, can, that information can fed, be fed back into your design to reduce some of the, the parameters that can make that kind of design very heavy. 
So it, it's, it's, it's a very easy way to do this if you can incorporate them during the design stage itself. Now, in, in case you cannot incorporate during the design, we typically uh, retrofit our sensors onto existing aircraft structures. And there is absolutely nothing wrong in doing that. Um, you know, you can uh, install on any kind of structure that's out there. We are installing right now on an aircraft that's, uh, I think that's been flying for about 35 years. It's a pretty old aircraft, uh, but you, we still can monitor any kind of fatigue cracks that are, that's occurring in those structures. Yeah, no, that's great. And then my other question was, Thinking about back to our previous discussion on digital thread and digital twin, do you see your, your software being able to kind of update the maintenance schedule in a live manner, kind of auto riding to a digital twin if once we get to that stage, the kind of constant monitoring? Yes, we actually do. In fact, we are actually building um, what we call the digital structural health monitoring software, uh, which can be used towards uh, the modeling and simulation um, aspects for uh, the, 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 the digital twin. So, you know, because the digital twin really requires you to have some sort of testing and validation. So the sensors that are incorporated in our system can provide that kind of information to enable that kind of testing and validation. But then we are also incorporating the uh, simulation and modeling tools into our system so that you can actually have both aspects, the simulation modeling, as well as the actual testing data incorporated so that you can you can check against the digital twin yeah and then finally my last question is maybe maybe naive by me but i'm just wondering for certain parts like rotor blades or things that are designed for vibration stress and over design so to speak do you believe your system is accurate enough to where we get to a realm of design where we are designing products with shorter lifespans knowing that we will be able to accurately replace them when needed uh, yes, we do. Actually, we, we work with uh, a number of industries. It's not just the aircraft industries where the lifespan of the product can vary anywhere from like two to three years to all the way to up to 30 years. So it, it's going to really depend on how the design incorporates the sensors, uh, but we can help with any kind of platform. Yeah, for sure. I just see a space where you could, if you're knowing very well that, say, uh, a part has a lifespan of one year or two years. And so you could design it for lighter to knowing that you'll have to replace it at the one year mark if you could right. verify that it needed to be replaced and right. not have to worry about the, the accidental failure. So very interesting stuff. Yeah. Right. And, and if you can incorporate the, um, it, the, um, uh, the sensors into the structure, you might be able to actually prolong the life of that platform because sometimes if you don't know that there is damage in the, in the structure, uh, then you really can't do much about it. But if there is damage and it's not at a critical location or it's a not, not an at of a critical size, you can start monitoring it to see, you know, well, maybe we should wait till it grows to a certain size before we do something about this, whether to repair or replace that kind of component. So there's a lot of options that you can uh, enable with the, the incorporation of sensors into the structures. Yeah, for sure. And then just a quickly a little bit on the weight impact. Mm -hmm. you, you see that when you add, I think earlier you mentioned that when you're adding these systems, you actually see a reduced weight because you're able to design to a lower uh, factor of safety. Is that correct? Correct. Fine. Great. And then just one more question from Josh. And Nate <laughs> What's that? Um, I'm sorry, working. Good. I think I'm working. Could you go on mute, sir? Well, I'm at home. Yeah. I work from home, yeah. Sir, could you go on mute? I'm just interfering a little bit. Oh, yeah. And I know Sterling, I'm not... I think you can mute him. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm just looking at this. It is actually here. very good. Okay, I think that, that's got it now. Sorry, last question for you, sure. Rita. Um, so for the embedded systems, if something a sensor was to fail or something was to go wrong, how is the easiest it to repair? Or say, for example, in a bird strike, if it affected the embedded design, how hard is it to repair the system? So uh, if you actually embed the sensors inside the structure, um, might be a little bit difficult to, 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 to and, uh, remove the sensor to repair it. However, because we use uh, what, what we were ta talking about, like sensor network concept, um, if you lose a couple of sensors, you don't really lose the capability for damage detection. 
you might lose a little bit of sensitivity, uh, but you will still be able to detect damage in the stru structure. So unless you lose a lot of the sensors, you don't need to do anything about it. No, that's wonderful. Thank you, Amrita. Thanks for coming on. I, I enjoyed it for sure. Um, switching over now to our last but not least speaker, uh, Jeff McChinster from Targon speaking on counter UAS, counter small UAS on the move. Jeff, over to you. Yeah, Sterling, can you hear me fine? Just to make sure. Yes, we got you, sir. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Jeff McChesney. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Target Arm. And today I'm going to take it just kind of a slightly different slant about uh, talking all about what I've got uh, and what I'm working on, although I'll mention some of that. It's really about where we're going as a future. And this is focused predominantly uh, around the military side of the equation, although we're a dual use company from uh, package delivery as well as a um, small UAS capability. And some of the things that we're probably going to need to start thinking about both on the ground and with the orbs uh, moving on into the future. And I'll try and address those uh, as I move forward in time. Uh, so who am I? Uh, just to give you a little bit of background on me, I'm a former Air Force Colonel and F-15 Combat Commander, uh, a Fighter Weapons School graduate, and I'm also a Harvard National Security Fellow. Uh, and I spent a lot of my time uh, when I was in the Air Force as a weapons and tactics officer trying to think through very, very complex problems and then solving those so that uh, we never end up losing an air war uh, as long as uh, any of us are alive. Uh, on the commercial side, uh, as I already mentioned, I'm with Target Arm. Uh, we're both in the military and commercial uh, UAS uh, industry, although we're not a UAS uh, manufacturer ourselves. And we're currently under a couple of the small business innovation research funds uh, uh, contracts. Uh, the, the major one that we're working on right now is using our system, which I'm gonna show you a slight bit about uh, for nuclear munitions convoy protection uh, for, uh, for obviously trying to protect uh, nuclear we weapons from getting out of, uh, out of our hands. Uh, the device that I'm going to talk about is that we have a device that launches and recovers uh, both rotary and fixed wing drones from any moving vehicle autonomously, uh, and it also does it in high wind conditions. Uh, the device that you're seeing here is on top of our vehicle, which I'll show you a little bit of diagrams a little bit later, uh, but it can actually be put on any moving vehicle or boat uh, or orb for that matter uh, as we go forward in time. As you see here right now, the, the idea is, is the drone gets picked out of the air by two sets of pins from opposite sides and it flies away from a static position. And this is moving. Hey, Jeff, we're not seeing your slides. If you could just share those for us. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sure. I have shared them. So let me back up. Hang on a second. Get out of here. You're saying you're not seeing my slides? Oh, okay, sorry. Let me see if I can take them off and put them back on. That would be a very difficult problem, wouldn't it? Yeah, we got them now. Thank you, sir. Okay, all right. Good. Good. Thanks for letting me know. I again, I'm in the blind, right? I don't know that I'm, what I don't know. Uh, for sure. Anyways, I went over this. I went over this background. Uh, that, as I was just talking about our device, uh, now that you can actually see what it looks like, uh, works uh, for both rotary and fixed wing drones from any moving vehicle. Uh, and these have two sets of pins that approach from the top and the bottom. Uh, and this is viewing uh, live demonstrations uh, from the truck that we're actually going to show in the next slide. And right here, the, the pins are actually closing around a drone that's flying. And this is from a static location. The, dr the truck is stopped and that's uh, flying away. And now when the uh, truck is moving, the air goes through these pins and the drone is already trying to fly. Uh, it can't, the pins remove and it flies away. You can get very, very high cycle rates here for, for uh, launches and recoveries. And we've already demonstrated this with all three of our last uh, prototypes uh, at over 65 miles an hour. So it's extremely capable and we planned it uh, for up to 300 miles an hour. Uh, so it will work uh, airborne for very fast vehicles. Okay, so now kind of why, are, why am I even talking to you about counter small UAS uh, being on the move? Well, one of the problems is that mobility is a basic tenet of warfare but in the military, and we're talking Air Force, Army, Navy, and Marines, in a lot of cases, the utility of, of UASs and uh, in the future orbs are going to be from static locations, uh, which is the anathema of what we want to be doing as a warfare by being on the move and not getting shot in the process, especially when we're prosecuting an attack. Uh, on top of that, the small UASs are getting more and more sophisticated very, very swiftly. Uh, the cycle times uh, of uh, new generations are really fast. We're going to see the same thing in the orb arena, I believe. It's just going to happen with all the technologies that we've got and all the autonomy that we have. It's going to go very quickly, and we're going to start adding all kinds of capabilities uh, to those orbs. 
And this is one of the key components from a, from a warrior perspective is, is that you can't have it where the defensive systems that we're trying to create cost more than the offensive systems that people are uh, attacking you with. And so we, we currently have the, an asymmetrical warfare going on where we're spending you know, millions of dollars trying to shoot down a thousand dollar drone. And that asymmetric warfare creates a very extremely difficult uh, problem set. The other aspect of this is it's uh, uh, these drones and the small UASs are inexpensive and they're easy to operate uh, and they don't take a lot of training and they're tiny and they're tough to see. Uh, sensors uh, really are working hard to, to locate them. Uh, and then even if you can find them, you got to target them and try and kill them. Uh, and it, when you take a look at the future opportunities that uh, you're looking in the war games and stuff, is that the swarming uh, just basically will overrun uh, our air bases, will overrun our uh, brigades and battalions as they're moving forward in time. Uh, and so what ends up happening here is, is that if you, if you stay from a static position, even if you're launching and recovering, whether it's an orb or a small UAS, uh, you end up with a line of sight defense uh, where you're too close. They're already within a half a mile or a mile from you uh, and you're already under attack. And if you increase the swarm to 500 or 1,000 inbound uh, attackers, it's too close and too late. So you've got to get, you've got to get out, you've got to get further out in front of them uh, and you've got to end up trying to kill them with multi-layer attacks. And our orbs are not going to be immune. Uh, this is me speaking of my opinion. Uh, I'm in this space. I'm thinking about it every day right now using our current technology. Uh, and they're going to immediately be weaponized. They're going to be immediately attacked. We're going to have larger payload cap uh, capacities with the orbs. Uh, and in the military arena, even though we're going to be thinking about like taking them from uh, static locations and launching them back and forth, uh, they're going to be targets uh, and uh, they're going to be big targets uh, because people want to take those out versus even the smaller UASs. So one of the things that I'm espousing and trying to, uh, to bring up today and hopefully get a conversation around is this idea about standoff and extended range. We've got to create the capability uh, of countering the attacks that we're going to get from these swarms uh, on the ground uh, or in the air for that matter as far away from us as we can uh, so that we end up with a defense in depth. None of our systems are going to work 100%. We don't have any hittles out there. They're all missiles. Uh, we, you know, electronic so solutions sometimes will work, other times won't. We need to get multiple shots at these as far range away as we can. And that and that will end up helping us uh, to retain our friendlies. Uh, one of the things that I bring back from our F-15 arena when I used to fly was it, you want to try and get your first look. And if you can get a first look, which is your sensor systems, then you'll probably get your first shot. And the further out you can take that shot, again, you increase your chances of taking most of them out. So you want a layered solution. The Army understood this uh, in the late 60s and 70s when they had a, a system called Shorad uh, that they were trying to you know, defend against a couple of uh, inbound fighters at low altitudes. And now the swarms are just a completely different problem set. So one of the things, because we're in this space, is, is that you're going to need to be able to operate uh, in the small UAS uh, arena from moving platforms. And that's one of the specialties that we have is we obviously can operate from a moving platform and currently it's uh, 65 to 75 miles an hour. And you wanna to head towards those threats. And then you wanna be able to launch something that goes even further out there. And so you wanna launch myriad UASs with capable systems. They may have kinetic systems on board, they may have uh, electronic systems on board, uh, whatever you wanna end up targeting, we're gonna to have to end up countering them at a and an a, a equal a dollar sign, or hopefully in our favor from a defensive perspective. Versus when we want to offensively utilize these, we also want to overwhelm the other side. Uh, the, other, the other aspect of this is that there are going to be myriad counter UAS systems that are, that are turning over their life cycles very, very quickly. You might buy, a, you might buy one of these UASs, and a year later, you don't, you don't want it anymore. You want something new and, and more capable. And what ends up happening is, is if you start developing launch and recovery systems that work proprietary just for those systems, uh, you end up having a very, very difficult time moving as the technology continues to move forward. And you need to actually do the reverse and future proof it. And so you need an agnostic launch and recovery system. Whether it's our system or anybody else's is not my point today. My point is we're going to need to have the capability to launch these UASs, both rotary and fixed wing, uh, for very quick uh, countering against these swarming threats. And then we're going to have to lay our sensors uh, and the targeting systems. And I know the military and each of the services is doing this right now, trying to provide the targeting and then get that down to the local level. But then we need to be on the move is the key component to this. And these orbs can be weaponized uh, today. 
uh, we can already put stuff on them if we wanted to. The payload capacity that they're going to have uh, is much higher uh, than you're getting with these small UASs. And they're going to end up having the same problems that we have with fighter aircraft, which is you start off with the basic functionality and then you start adding electronics and you start adding new missiles, you start adding new weapon systems and the weight starts increasing as well. But the idea that our orbs are going to just uh, be like the civilian side and move between, you know, safe locations, uh, I think is, uh, is going to be folly. We're going to have them deep in the battlefield. They're going to be involved in the, in the battle space uh, and we're going to end up probably weaponizing them and we can actually weaponize them with uh, hosted uh, UASs, small UASs from them that are going to help protect them as well. So I believe what we're going to see is uh, all things that are moving are all going to have the capability to have smaller uh, autonomous vehicles and weapon systems coming off of them uh, to help protect us uh, from that layered defense that I was talking about. So that's a, that's a perspective that I have, that we're in this space right now. I'm not really focusing too much on what we're capable of doing, but uh, we are creating this capability at a TRL-8 uh, level right now. We're the, the size of our Tular, which is the product you see on top of our truck there, uh, the new version that's going to be out next month is 10 times that size. Uh, and so I'll open it up for questions and answers and uh, anybody's re you know, rebuttal of how I view the future battle space. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Jeff. I think uh, we'll take you on your word for it now. We really like to focus these webinars on the commercial side, so I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on the commercial use cases for your system. I think a, a mobile launch platform for orbs is a very interesting idea. And one of the questions from the audience actually was on the idea of a large unmanned airship possibly doing in-air capture and release for maybe something like package delivery. So yeah, so, so uh, th yeah, this, I mean, this is a commercial aspect you're looking at in the slide right here, which is this is our package delivery truck. This is a actually a postal service truck that we've refurbished. Uh, so the package delivery market is the number one uh, supply chain issue in the world. Uh, you know, they're moving $3 trillion a year through that uh, supply chain. Uh, and we envision that once the airspace opens up here in the United States, package delivery will explode. Now, one of the things that's going on uh, as we continue to pursue the uh, the uh, commercial aspects of using TULAR uh, is that we're, we're held back right now. Most of the technology is being held because of what's called visual line of sight uh, capacity or capabilities with few beyond visual line of sight waivers that have been granted. And most of the money has been spent from a static location. Uh, uh, you know, Google Wing or FedEx or UPS is launching from a, uh, you know, a, a, a one of the prescription uh, locations and launching out the, you know, two to three miles but they're bringing back rotary wing and they're bringing back uh, empty on the way back, which is uh, in the cargo business, that's a, you know, that, that's an empty dead haul coming backwards. So we're in this space, but it's not just the package delivery, it's line inspections, it's oil and gas, it's first responders. You can well imagine that if you had the capability of this sitting on the, on the back, launching a fixed wing now, which, uh, which we're currently developing, you launch a fixed wing off the back of this as a fire chief responding to a fire and he's six minutes out or she's six minutes out, launches that airplane, uh, takes a look at what's gonna happen and starts redirecting the fire response five minutes before they get there about who's on where, you know, who's going down what road, who's getting that water, uh, lives are gonna be saved. So there are many, many use cases where the small UAS on the commercial side are going to drive the technology from the capability side but the warrior side is going to have to absorb those extremely fast. Well, that's great to hear, Jeff. And then, like I said, I, one of the questions was, um, orbs are not supposed to need a launch pad runway, but you've shown highways in your picture on a, a couple of vehicles. Have any, I just save a helicopter launcher recover? Yeah, just, I guess a little bit on the, the range of capabilities of capture for your, your system. Are you constrained in any way by rotor blade size or uh, well, I mean, uh, the, the size of Tular is only constrained by the number of pins we have. So we're scalable. Uh, I designed it originally for 18 feet wide, 12 feet deep, and six feet high. Uh, the next version we're building, which is our MVP, is uh, five feet wide, four feet deep, and four feet high, capturing most of the small UASs. But I actually designed this originally for the back of a C5 and C17 uh, to come out down the cargo door and then down into the open airstream at uh, 200 to 300 knots. So this is designed for UCAVs uh, from the original concept, but I put it on the ground first to start building it and to start testing it. And then the, the entire ground market opened up as well. But everything that flies, everything that moves uh, has some capability to carry a daughter capability. Uh, it just takes our ingenuity 
and, uh, and design and you know, a little bit of money to actually put those on. So uh, the, the idea that you can put this on an orb, the idea that you can end up uh, launching smaller uh, vehicles off of an orb, uh, and you can deliver, by the way, packages uh, to and from commercial vehicles. And we've been contacted by automobile manufacturers where they want to put Tular on cars and SUVs to give you a digital connectivity to the world, not just, uh, sorry, a physical connectivity to the world and not just a digital connectivity while you're on the move. Oh, that's awesome. I can't wait to get my McDonald's delivered right to my car. <laughs> got it. You got it. It's, it's, it's coming. I mean, it's the Jetsons. It's, it's going to happen. All right, sir. Well, thanks for coming on today. We appreciate it. We're going to have to wrap up here at the end of our time. But I appreciate all our speakers coming on today. It was a very informative talk, and uh, hopefully everyone out there in the audience enjoyed it, had some thoughts that came to their mind and some connections were made. So join us next week for another round of the ecosystem tours, and also we'll be joined by this aircraft speak on a little bit of their project, their cooperation with Agility Prime and their flight demonstration this week here in Texas. So that's all from us. Thank you, guys. Have a great weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, darling.